Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Carmel New Church. I'm Pastor Mark, and I'll be leading you in worship this morning. Welcome to all of those who are joining us online. It's lovely to have you join us as part of our community. As you came in, you should have received a pew card, and in the pew card is our order of service for today, and it has the prayer that we will say along with our recitation. So please keep this handy as we go through the service. We begin every service by opening up of the Lord's Word. The Lord's Word is where we go to hear the Lord speak to us, to learn from Him, and to help Him guide us in our life. So please, will you rise for the opening of the Word? The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. O Lord God, our Saviour Jesus Christ, we come to you to open up your word and to learn the stories that you give us there. And Lord, we know within every story there is a principle, there are ideas that you would love us to learn. And Lord, as we spend time today talking about your word, will you inspire our hearts and our minds to awaken to you, to hear you speak, and to have a will in us a desire within us to go and to live according to what you teach. Lord, be with us now as we learn from your word. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. Please rise. If you'll open now in your pew cards, we will say together this morning's recitation, which is taken from Psalm 1, verse 1 to 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Amen. Please remain standing while we receive the offering. O Lord, receive these gifts from the people of your church as a sign of their willingness to learn from you. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning again, everybody. Morning, children. So one of the positives that's come out of this whole, whole COVID thing for the last two years this gives me a lot of material to use as part of my talks. So, over the last two years, who of you have had to spend time in isolation? Who of you have had to spend five days, ten days, two weeks in isolation? How long did you spend in isolation? You didn't? You, you, 
Right? How, much, how long does your sister say you spent in isolation? A couple of days. Yeah. Other hands, how long did you spend in isolation? Two weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. Oh, dear. Yeah. Anybody else spend some time in isolation? Uh, I spent time two weeks. Right. Now, there's somebody that we're going to read about today who spent even more time in isolation with his family. What do you think the story is about today? Noah's Ark. All right. So that's going to be our story today about Noah and the Ark. Now, once you had spent time in isolation, were you wanting to get out of that? What were you, what were you thinking was going to be the first thing? When I get out of this, this is what I'm going to do. What, what were you thinking? What was the first thing you were going to do once you get out, out of isolation? Any ideas? What, what were you hoping to do? Go visit with somebody. Right. Anybody wanted to go visit with somebody after isolation, being stuck by yourself? Yeah. Right. Maybe it was, I want to get to the shops and do some shopping for myself. Right. There could have been lots of things that we wanted to do. Go see people, go places, just get off your own property and see something different for a while. Just a change of scenery. Right. So being in isolation is difficult, and then how does it feel once it's over, you wake up in the morning, your isolation is over, how do you feel? How did you feel? Liberated. Liberated. Free. Did you feel free? Did you feel like you were in a prison? Right? Feel like you're in a prison, and now I'm free. Ah, I can go anywhere I want. I can do what I want. I can see the people that I want to see. Freedom. Do you know the story of Noah very well? Have you heard it before? Okay. What are some of the things of the story of Noah? You can tell me some of the things about the story of Noah. Dessa, what do you remember about the story? Okay. He was in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights, and it rained and it rained and rained. And what happened? What happened to the waters? It flooded, didn't it? And was he alone in the ark? Who was with him in the ark? Anybody know? His family, his wife and his sons and his sons' wives were in the ark. Who else was in the ark? Lots of animals. Lots of animals right? Just some animals of, well, we like dogs and cats, so we'll have dogs and cats, but we don't really like alligators, so we'll leave them out. Was it just some animals and not others? Of every kind of animal, right. Every kind of animal was in the ark with Noah. So that's the story of Noah climbing into the ark with his family, with all the animals, and it rains for 40 days, for 40 nights. It floods. And then I'm going to read a little bit to you, which is a bit of a summary of the end of the story. You can follow along in your pew card. We're in Genesis 8. So after 40 days, then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. The flood started to disappear. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you, and bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you. Okay, so go out. Now that, you're, now that you're free, go out. And what is the first thing that Noah does when he goes out the ark, when he is out of his isolation? This is what he does. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. What does it mean to build an altar 
and to offer sacrifice. What, how, do we th- how can we think about that in today's terms? What does it mean to build an altar and offer sacrifice? Anybody have an idea? What are we doing today? We might not be offering sacrifices. Right, we, we've come to bow down. We've come to worship the Lord. So when we read in the Lord's Word about building an altar and making sacrifices, it's about our worshiping the Lord and our giving to the Lord. So instead, we don't have burnt offerings that we give to the Lord, but what, what can we give to the Lord? What, is it those good, what are the things that we give to the Lord, but all the things that are good and true? Other words that we can use instead of things that are good and true, we can think of the things that we give of kindness to other people in our actions and thoughtfulness in our words. That is what we can give of ourselves in worship to the Lord. And all of those things have to do with loving our neighbor, isn't it? If we do kind things, we're loving our neighbor. If we're saying kind words, thoughtful words, we're loving our neighbor. And that was the first thing that Noah did when he got out of the ark. And it's a reminder to us as we begin a new, a new year of the first thing that we should do. Not just once a year with the beginning of a new year, but every day or every interaction that we have with someone, the first thing that we should give, the first thing once we meet somebody is to give of ourselves in caring and thoughtful ways. So, what are some caring actions that we can do to others, or what are some thoughtful words that we might say to someone? Who's got some examples? What are ways that we care in what we do and are thoughtful in what we say? When you're walking past somebody, what might you say? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening. How are you doing? Here we go. Right, you notice them. Oh, you look them in the eye and you say, Hi, nice to see you. Good to see you. Welcome. Right, those are being just some kind actions. What does our face look like? Is there a frown on our face? Is that the action that we have on our face? No, when we see someone, we smile. Right? It's, a, it's a kind action. It's just smiling to someone. Kind, thoughtful words is about noticing someone. Good morning. Good to see you. Right? Where, wherever we are. We could be out on the road, walking past someone who's, who's walking, their jo- walking their dog, and we could say that. We could be at school, walking past someone in the corridor, and we can say that. Right? We can do this Anywhere, the first thing that the Lord asks us to do is to do things kindly and thoughtfully to others. So as we begin a new year, that's an important idea. Think of Noah coming out of the ark with all the animals, free after 40 days, and the first thing that he does is kindness, giving to the Lord. There's a reminder to us as we start a new year of the most important thing in our life every day with every person that we meet, kindness, thoughtfulness in the things that we say, the things that we do. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for all the wonderful things that you give to each one of us every day. We thank you for the life that we have when we wake up in the morning. And Lord, as we turn our minds outwards to the things that we need to do every day, Lord, will you help us to put what is important first, that the most important thing of any part of our day is sharing of our kindness with others.
sharing of our thoughtfulness with others. So Lord, as we go out into our week and as we go out into our year, can you help us to remember that the first thing to do is to worship you by loving our neighbor. Amen. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Amen. Please be seated. We will now have an interlude, and because we are unable to provide uh, Sunday school at this moment, if there are families who would like to leave, you're welcome to leave during the interlude. Good morning again, everybody. So we're still on the topic of a new year. And the question I have is, are you ready? Are you awake? Are you paying attention? Are you aware of the fullness of your life? The story of Noah that we had with our children is a story that applies to each one of our lives. 
It's a story of how the Lord protects something very special in us as we go through the storms of life. And as we go through the storms, so there is an opportunity for a newness of life to emerge on the other side. And so the story describes a journey for us of rebirth or of regeneration. But the problem is, it doesn't just happen. Spiritual journey doesn't just happen to us. It requires that we are awake, that we are aware, that we are participating in the process. Otherwise, we get stuck in the storm. We get stuck in the storm. And it's only through our awakening to spiritual things that we emerge into the newness of life. And the fact is that we can remain stuck and blind to the fact that we're actually in a storm, that we're actually in the flood of life. And so how do we come to see that we're in that flood? How do we awaken to this journey that the Lord is calling each one of us to? The reality is that the more that we become aware of the flood, the more opportunities open up, up to us to find a new way out. The more we are aware, the more opportunities open up. And it doesn't just come with waiting. It requires our attention. So last week, Justin spoke about awakening to an idea about our thoughts. Are you aware that your thoughts are not your own? An important spiritual idea that helps us to awaken to the spiritual reality around us. If we're unaware, we can't deal, we can't change with what is before us. So there is an, a, an example of how important ideas are and having the right idea about our ideas that helps us awaken to new opportunities. This thought isn't mine, I can choose to dwell on it or not. So we continue that line of thinking, thinking deeply about, well, what is happening in my thoughts? What is happening in my life? We're going to continue that idea today. So my question for you is, in your experience of life, are you experiencing true reality? Is what you experience true reality? Is it the true life? Are you experiencing life in a true way, or are you being deceived? Are you deceiving yourself? Are you living in your own made-up world? Or do you live life, do you feel that you're living life with your eyes open, that you're aware of things, that you know what is happening around you? I wonder how you feel about that. Because in my life, I go, but of course I see reality. I can see what's going on around. Of course I'm living in the real world. But then you read things in the new ch teachings for the new church, and you have to change your perspective on what you feel life is before you. Here's an example. Here's an example to illustrate that your reality is not real. Maybe you've experienced this. You've had a tough day at work. You're exhausted. You're tired. You're probably a little bit grumpy. And I go home, and I'm putting my, walk through the door, putting my stuff down, taking my coat off, and there's just that noise in the house. Right? The music is on too loud, the TV is on, the kids are making a racket, and come in the door, and I'm, I'm already screaming at the kids to quieten things down, just get things under control. Things quieten down a little bit. Walk into the lounge, or walk into the kitchen, and there's stuff everywhere. Half drunk uh, glasses of, of juice, there's food out from lunchtime, there's 
clothes everywhere, just stuff everywhere. And again, now you're shouting at the kids, come clean up your stuff, get things in order, blah, blah, blah. We've experienced that. My experience in that moment is saying everybody is against me and I am against everybody. Everything is out of order and I'm here to put everything in order. That's my reality. For the rest of the family on the outside, they're looking and saying, Dad's having a bad day. Their reality is very different to my reality. What I'm experiencing is all mine. And what they're experiencing is something completely different. So do we re live in reality? We live in our reality. We live the way we create reality for ourselves. I want to read to you from the teachings for the new church, from the book Secrets of Heaven, and you can follow along in your pew card. We're reading from number 920. It says, Everyone is capable of realizing that our general viewpoint governs all our specific perceptions, including, of course, all our sensual impressions, whether acquired through our eyes or our ears. So our general perspective on something governs everything, the way we're thinking, the way we're feeling, all the way down to our senses and what we're perceiving through our eyes and our ears. All of that is determined by a governing idea or a governing mood, a governing perspective in our lives. In fact, we lack any interest in the object of our senses unless they make part of that overall picture. Right? So unless something affirms the way I'm feeling, I'm not even going to see it. I will see those things that affirm and disregard things that don't. To those whose hearts are glad, for instance, everything they hear or see appears cheerful and smiling. But to the depressed, everything they see or hear seems grim and melancholy. The same is true for all other cases as well, because our general mood pervades everything and causes us to see and hear everything within the context of our overall mood. Nothing outside that context is even visible, but is virtually absent or irrelevant. We only see and hear the things that we want to see and hear. We only hear and see the things we want to hear and see. Now, that principle is very well illustrated within media. We can read a story here, and because it affirms our point of view, we read the article. We come across an article that is opposite to how we, how we think and believe, and we start it and then we dismiss it. We're not interested in it. It's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't apply. It's wrong. We come up with all sorts of excuses why that article is not to be read, and this one is. We choose what we want to hear and what we want to see. Everything else we excuse as irrelevant. So we see the world we want to see. We see the world the way we are, and not the reality that is much, much broader than our small perspective of the world. So we can choose to see the world as corrupt, as broken. We can choose to see Government is corrupt and broken. The church is corrupt and broken. We can see whatever we want to see is corrupt and broken, and we will see it that way. But at the same time, we will miss all the things that are beautiful. We will miss all the things that are wholesome within the world, within the church, within the government. 
On the opposite side, we can have rose-tinted glasses and just think, well, the world is, is fine, everything is fine, everything's great in the world. But then not be willing to see the pain and the real suffering that exists within the world and within communities. So we see it the way we want to see it. But we need to be able to see both sides. We don't want to remain in our small, little, closed reality. We need to be able to open up our minds and see things more clearly, broader and broader and broader, and get out of our small, little way of seeing life as a reflection of what I want it to be. So how do we come to see what we can't see? How do we come to see that we are blind? How do we come to see the other side of the argument that we're having with our spouse? How do we come to see their reality and not just our reality? How do we come to see the other side of the argument when it comes to our children? What is their reality? It's very different to where I am in my reality. How do I come to see them from their reality and not mine. So how do we awaken to this? How do we become aware of this? How do we broaden our minds to see things more clearly? One small spiritual principle at a time. And it takes a lifetime. One small spiritual principle at a time is what slowly opens us up to see more and more clearly the reality that is around us and not just ourselves. Right? We don't need to know everything there is to know in order to change our lives. We don't need to know everything there is to know in the doctrines for the church. All we need is one spiritual idea to work on. That's all we need, just one. Just one spiritual idea at a time. That's how we change. So I want to read to you from the book Sacred Scriptures, number 60, and you can follow along in your pew card. This helps to shine a light on our blindness. Why we can't see what we can't see. Why we are caught up in our own reality and can't see other realities. Nothing blinds us more completely than our self-importance. Nothing blinds us more completely than our self-importance and our convincing ourselves of what is false. In the story of Noah, that flood water that floods that whole story represents all our false thinking. We can be stuck in that false thinking. And we're going to read a little bit further about this false thinking. Our self-importance is our infatuation with ourselves and our consequent pride in our intelligence. Right? I am right. I know what is happening. I can see reality, right? We have a pride in thinking that we know and our convincing ourselves of what is false is a darkness that pretends to be light, a darkness that pretends to be light. And this is probably what makes change and spiritual change so difficult is because we're in the darkness and we don't even know it. We're in the darkness, and it feels like we're in the light. Well, I know. All right, I know what the Lord teaches. I know I'm right. I know, right, we put our trust in our self-intelligence that I know. That's a falsity. Whenever we are sure about our own thinking, we're in falsity. I know what you're thinking. Falsity. I know I'm right. Falsity. My reality is the true reality. False thinking. Our minds are filled with false thinking. 
that we've convinced ourselves that we know that we have the answer. It's interesting when reading that spiritual principle, how the, the pride in self-intelligence reacts to what the Scripture said. That doesn't apply to me. No, that's talking about somebody else. No, that's talking about those people or those people. It's not talking about me. Pride and self-intelligence, false idea. What the Lord teaches, He teaches about you. He teaches about me. He's not teaching about something that happened in the past. He's not teaching about something that might happen in the future. The Lord teaches about what is in your life at this moment. Your life is flooded with false thinking. My life is flooded with false thinking. That is the truth. I am blind to where I am. I am stuck in my own reality. That is the truth. How do we get out of it? By using one's principle at a time. At the bottom of your pew card there, and I didn't print a pew card for myself, I've given you a principle. Thank you very kindly. All right, at the bottom of your pew card there, it says principle. Okay, so taking that idea from Sacred Scriptures number 60 and putting it into, into a principle, sort of simplifying it a bit. Pride in our intelligence blinds us from the reality of our own lives. That's the spiritual principle that we get from today's teaching. Pride in our intelligence blinds us from the reality of our own life. So we're also taught in the teachings for the new church that to learn the truths is one thing, but to apply them to our lives is the ultimate goal. So my New Year's resolution is to try and give you more tasks as part of my teaching to you. So the spiritual task for my life, and you can use this, or you can make up your own from the spiritual principle, but the task that I'm going to take with me for this week is when I feel myself getting ready to disagree with somebody else, right? and we can sort of generally feel that, that rising up, oh, I'm getting ready, I'm, I'm getting ready to fight now, but when I get that feeling inside myself, I will notice my need to be right. Okay. So I'm taking that spiritual principle, putting it into a task, and I'm going to take that task with me during the week. Why? Why do that? Because we are trying to wake up to our spiritual life. We're trying to wake up to what the Lord is trying to teach us. By taking the Lord's truths and making them practical in our lives in a very simple way, He can help us to awaken. And when we think about the story of Noah, it talks about him taking the covering off the top of the ark and letting that light in. And that's what we're doing when we're taking those tasks and in the moment, in that moment when we feel that feeling that I'm going to fight, that we think about my desire, my self-intelligence that says I'm right. And in that moment, I can start to recognize, I'm awake to what is happening within me. I'm awake to the Lord flowing into my mind as I open up that covering and for the Lord to show me how true his truths are right? my pride of self-intelligence is going to say eh, that's not really true that's not true for my life false idea everything the lord teaches is true my pride of self-intelligence is not there to try and is going to try and judge god and going to try and judge his truths and say yes it is true or no, it's not. That's not what we're about. We're about being humble and saying, this is true. 
Lord, please show me how it is true in my life. And so that's a prayer that we can take with us. Take the task and take that prayer with you. Lord, show me how this is true in my life. With those two things in our minds, that prayer and that simple task to open our minds, the Lord can do His work. In those moments, we can uh, look at our thoughts, judge our own thoughts, and see where we are actually at. How stuck am I in my false ideas? How am I stuck in the flood of false thinking? So this is a simple task. Well, it's a simple task on a piece of paper. It's not a simple task when it comes to actually doing it during the week. But it's a task to take with you and to try. And I'm going to preach a whole other sermon on the art of failure. Because you're going to fail at the task. And that's perfect. Because there's room to learn when we fail. Failure is not the is not the thing to, to fear. It's not trying. That's what we should fear. So take this task with you. Try apply it to your life. And hopefully the Lord can open up that window to heaven and allow His light to shine into you and show you how this simple truth is true in your life and lead you onwards to a new life. Amen. Please rise. To the one and only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, our Saviour Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your truths that are there to reveal our life to us. Lord, as we take the simple task with us today, Lord, will you give us the strength and the courage to keep it in our minds. And in those moments where we feel ourselves getting angry, getting upset, putting ourselves against another. Lord, will you help bring your light into our minds that we can remember the task and reflect to see how your truths are true in our life. Lord, we, we know that you are always there. You are the one who's going to guide us and lead us into doing this task. Lord, we thank you for all the ways in which you lead, in which you guide, and in which you teach us your truths. Amen. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Amen. Please rise. Please be seated. 